this is, this is, this is. I was just, uh, I was just jamming out kind of right now. I don't know if you can, I don't know if you can hear, I don't know if you can hear what I hear. Do you hear anything? No. Okay. It's just in my ears then. (laughs) It's your, your new song, your new song. Oh, you were jamming out to Helios? Yeah, I was, I had it on just chilling while, while I was waiting and, uh, I had the video on and everything. So it's really cool. Really great song. Um, that's the latest track by, you just go by Biebs now, right? Yeah, when I play live, it's still Biebs and her money, you know, still a full band. It's Biebs like and I'm her money makers. By myself, you know, but just because I've been making so much music with so many other people, it was just easier to streamline it all, you know, that way. Because it's not, you know, with Biebs and her money makers, I was making music with, this, you know, not the same people, but just with that particular band, whatever that incarnation of that band was, um, at the time and now I'm just producing a lot more and just making tracks with a bunch of different people and putting out you know it's kind of interesting like I came from a live band world and then going into making tracks with people in the studio and then playing them live is a totally different (laughs) experience but I love it you know it's cool it's a cool process and I've really like been enjoying it you know do you have to do, do you have to like come up with live arrangements sometimes? Cause you're just like, I don't know how we even pull that off live. No, because I've been really working on partnering the two worlds, the digital and, and the live band world. So I'll make the track with, you know, another musician, another producer, whatever. We'll make the track in the box and then, but we'll play some live instruments on there. Then I'll take that to another studio and add, okay, I want live bass. I, I don't, there's just certain sound pretty much every sound is better with a live instrument. You know what I mean? And then, yeah, yeah, that's the problem you run into if you're doing everything out of the box is that you can't, um, it becomes hard to do a live arrangement or you have to play with tracks, which I learned I do not like playing to tracks or using tracks because although it makes the show consistent and everything's super on point, I like to just jam and call out solos and just take the track wherever it, going and you can't do that when you're play when you're sticking to the grid and I'm just you know I just realize like I'm very much a musician I don't enjoy being confined to the grid or anything like that you know even in the studio like I I um last year made this like super band called everybody and it's me Norwood from Fishbone um the drummer and guitar player from the expanders one of the guys from the Agri Lights and the Rise Roots, the keyboard player from Far Side, one of the dudes from Parliament Funkadelic. And we recorded to tape, which I've never done. Norwood's like, this is how we did it back in the day, Beeb. It's not that exciting. I'm like, no, <laughs> I've never recorded to tape before. This is all I've ever wanted to do because with music, you're capturing, especially when you're creating with other people and you have access to a full band. To me, it's just so much better to get it in the moment because you're capturing a moment in time. Mm-hmm. No moment is perfect. That's why I really don't love tracking on top of each other. It's not my favorite process. Um, just because I, I like the organicness of the moment. A song's always going to evolve from the moment you make it to the moment you play it live for years to come. It's mm-hmm. always going to change and evolve and you're going to find new parts and make it more exciting or new arrangements um, for a live show. But I think if you can just capture that one moment when it all started, that's the vibe. You know, you're capturing a vibe in time. So, um, yeah, we recorded like 13 songs to tape. And every Wednesday we would just get together and jam. And I would like live arrange. I wouldn't sing while we were recording so I could overdub later so I could stem those out or we could sample the music later. But um, you can hear me like talking in the back, like, all right, you know, you can hear all these little things, but it's dope. It's a vibe, you know, and it's all like sounds like it's an old soul record. That's great. Where's the record? Is it out? It's not out. It's not out yet. That's the next project. That's coming. I've literally worked on so much music. It's been so awesome. It's been Oh, let's talk. Let's talk all about it. Let's go back to Helium real quick because we touched on that. I, you know, it's a great song. It's, it's got a hook. It's fun video, by the way. I I was checking out the video. It's so crazy and colorful. I don't know if you want to talk about making that, but G Love and the Special Sauce, like, I didn't know he could rap. I knew he could play some harmonica, but what? Oh, dude, like, he's one of my favorite low-key rappers. You know what I mean? Like, he's, he, especially when he plays acoustic, like, that's when he really gets into it. And he worked 
in in the earlier part of his career, like he was working with a ghostwriter. I don't I don't know if he still does. This a guy that he was collabing with that was writing like a lot of the rap parts and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I I wish I could remember the guy's name. Um, but yeah, I mean, I kind of been doing that for years. I've people don't know that I had a rapper and beats that are money makers before we hit work to because we were a funk and jam band scene and mm-hmm. I love hip hop and funk and soul. Like that's where my heart is really at. You know, I grew up as a punk rock kid going yeah. to Warp Tour, of course, but you know You're um, branded more ska on the Warp Tour a little bit, but, on the warp, but we had to switch to a ska band because kids did not like funk bands <laughs> like parents would be rock we'd get this huge crowd. Like I remember our first two weeks on the tour, like we'd get this huge crowd. And, ever, and the parents would be rocking out and the kids would be like, oh, my mom's into this. I'm out. I'm going I'm to check out, out Black Girl Brides <laughs> or whatever. You know what I mean? And I'd be like, oh, guys, I think we should play ska music. I don't think they're down with the funk on Warp Tour. <laughs> well, it, yeah, I mean, it is a tough thing. It's not, it's not, it's just people aren't familiar with funk, but yeah. you have, you have ska, funk, pop elements for sure. And, and, yeah. and just rock and roll. But, but uh, that funk and reggae, you know, you do a lot of reggae. So you, you really... I don't know where you you get all of these influences. Where does the funk come from? The funkiness. Well, I was adopted, and so my parents were like, I don't know, in their mid forties when they adopted me. So I, they were like grand, grandparents' age, what all my friends' grandparents' age were. So I was listening to like soul and Motown. Hey, wait a minute, what? <laughs> yeah, I grew up like listening to soul and Motown, and then old school country like Willie Nelson, Patsy Cline, George Jones. I get a and little a little of that too like on your on your uh I Shine album from 2016. Oh yeah. There's there's everything fits together but then there's like a song that has oh a hint of like the bass could be a little country but it's not a country song at all but then there's some yeah. acoustics. I mean, you do a good job of incorporating your influences but making it it's always beebs. Thanks man. I really appreciate that. I mean, I to me, I don't love that there's genres of music. I think there's two kinds of music, good mm-hmm. and not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To me, that's the only two things that exist, you know? And, um, you know, so yeah, I grew up on a lot of that stuff as a young, when I was a young kid. And then I rebelled, of course, and was hardcore into punk rock. And actually, MXPX was a huge influence for me growing up because I grew up in Christian school and you guys were a Christian band back then. Oh, you know? right, yeah. And so you were one of the only bands I was allowed to listen to. And I probably saw MXPX at more super churches as a kid, like growing up, you know, I was allowed to go to these super tones, MXPX insiders shows safely without my parents having a meltdown. But um, the Christian school that I went to was also where all the gutter punks hung out (laughs) because they would have all these punk rock shows to try to get kids to go to the, you know, church there. And um, so I, you know, got into a a lot of punk rock through that scene actually. And then, you know, I've been going to warp tour since I was like 12 years old, you know, to see all the punk bands and, um, and ska bands and stuff. But the one thing I loved about warp tour too, was that they always had, rap on there you know they would yeah. have a hip-hop element so i was like oh this is all the best things like this is so great so you you've know? got all you've got all these influences but where does the voice come in where did you find your voice and develop it how did that happen um i grew up doing theater and dance and so i always sang sang in church too mm-hmm. um turns out my birth mother runs a karaoke business and sings too so I guess maybe it's just in my blood, you know. It must be, um, yeah. Performing and singing, but, um, but did you, yeah. Did you I, find that you I, had to work at it, by the way? Like, mm, was it just, I were did. you naturally good, or was there a, a time where you're just like, oh, wait, I thought I was good then, but now I'm actually getting good. Was there, was there any transition that happened? Well, the thing about doing theater is you're always emulating a production sound, right? So mm. I was really good at emulating and matching you know, tones and things for, for theater production. And then as a kid, I was like a hardcore karaoke whore. Like I would sneak into bars. <laughs> I was like 14 years old. I would never go to the bar because I didn't want them to kick me out. I just wanted to sing. So I would sneak into these bars. So I was 14 and like sing karaoke. They'd all be like, oh, who are you? And I'm like, What's your go-to <laughs> karaoke song? Uh, go-to karaoke song. What was it back then it, it versus maybe now? Oh, I really loved doing uh, Etta James at last, you know. Okay. I really loved. I really always loved doing that song. Soulful, and very soulful. I'm sure Dixie Chicks were involved in there somewhere, and like Natalie and Brulia or something. Did you do you know Goodbye I mean? Earl? Did you ever do that? 
Oh yes, I would. Goodbye, Earth. Done that song I before. love that song. It's so good. <laughs> I've 100% done that song before, but it took me a long time to find my own voice. You yeah, know, like, talk about um, that. Talk about that. Yeah. So I, when I was young, like younger, I I managed some bands and tour managed and was a booking agent and I put on shows. Um, and I started putting on shows in my hometown because I was tour managing. I was seeing all these rad acts that didn't come to Florida because Florida's a pain in the ass to tour down to. What's your what what town, by the way, in Florida? This was in uh, Melbourne, Florida. Like Melbourne? Oh, my God. Melbourne. I just posted, uh, like, a few weeks ago, I posted a video of MXPX playing a show in Melbourne. Yeah, and it was just, I was probably there. You probably <laughs> were. It was it was our probably one and only time we've ever gone to Melbourne. But it was a beautiful, yeah. nice little little town, little city. Yeah. It's a cool spot, um, the Space Coast, you know. Um, it's an engineering town. It was, like, all built off of NASA. And okay. And living there, basically. Did you see the – I know we're getting all over the place. But <laughs> did okay. you Did you see the uh, – the, the ro- any any rocket ships launching when you were young? Oh, yeah. That's, like – I didn't realize until I was older that, like, what a privilege that was because people come from all over the world to see these launches. And, like, when you grow up there – like every five minutes you're getting pulled out of class to go watch some rocket launch and you're like okay cool whatever uh and um it was just so normal you know Mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I got older that I was like and realized that like people come from all over to check out these launches and then I'm super nerd about like quantum science and just science in general so as I got older I just started talking to all these aerospace engineers and electrical engineers um, with my like weird science theories and stuff. Cause they had the education to back up. Like, am I crazy or is this really possible? And like, no, it's, cool. it's string, it's string theory. Don't worry. Beeps. You're not insane. I'm sure. Like, okay. Um, well, that's, so yeah, it was cool. Yeah. It was a cool place to grow up. You know, you're that's at the cool. beach, you're seeing rocket launches, but yeah, I didn't really appreciate that that wasn't a normal thing until I got older, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And that's okay. It, you know, because you're discovering something about yourself, you're discovering your voice you're discovering music, you're discovering, was it, was it music was the main thing growing up, like funk and then, you know, a little bit of punk rock and stuff like that. Uh, was that what you were into? You said, you know, you, you were talking about, you were doing plays, like what, what kind of, did you have to yeah, memorize did, lines like, theater and production. theater? Yeah. yeah. I did theater in school and then outside of school, I was part of like a private production company. Um, and we would just do this lady's plays, like her crazy idea plays or whatever. I don't even know what they were. They were cool though. You know, like one time I played a, the conscious of a man, the con- conscious of a man, you okay. know, one of these plays it was kind of tight. Um, but yeah, I, I just grew up doing that. My parents, cause I'm fr- originally from California. So my parents, when I was younger, had me in like Mickey Rooney's talent town and you know, all these other things. So I, I was, you know, like doing some modeling when I was younger and like doing, you know, and theater. And then I think I was like, I was young and they were like, you need to get new headshots. And I was like, I quit. My parents didn't know why I quit. And, um, why'd you quit? I didn't tell, they didn't, they didn't question it. They're just like, okay, whatever you want to do. Um, because I thought they were going to have to shoot me in the head. <laughs> I didn't know what a headshot meant. What? <laughs> <laughs> I just got freaked out. <laughs> I was really little. How old were you? I was like, no, I'm good. I was probably like five or six, you know, six years old or something. Yeah. I'm like, what? You know, you probably, like, dodged, you probably dodged a, a huge bullet there, like get, getting, going through the ringer of like child acting. And, you know, it seems like you kind of started doing theatrical plays anyway at, at a young, yeah. young age. Yeah, I was doing them anyway. Um, but then you but yeah, quit. Then I, then I grew up and, you know, I... I did a lot of things. I was a body piercer for a long time. That was still my side I, hustle when I would come home from tour still. But while I was I, doing that, I was also a promoter and a booking agent and all these other things and band manager. And so one of the bands, the first bands I started working with were their band called New School Dropouts. And they were really rad. They're from my hometown. And uh, that was the first band I sang on stage with for the first time because I was I had somehow, I don't know exactly when it happened. I was very outgoing and down and hamming it up when I was younger. And then I don't know if it was like just getting picked on in school so much or whatever happened, but I just wanted to be behind the scenes. I didn't want to, you know, it was just more comfortable for me there. And that was like the first band that was like, yeah, Beebs, you can sing. Come sing with us on stage. You know, I was like, okay. So I had this one song I would sing with them. 
And then there was another girl that I was the booking agent for. Her name's Kaylee Baker. She's seriously my still to this day, my one of my favorite singers of all time. Her range is ridiculous. She's one of the gnarliest songwriters and singers. And um, I think watching her, I think she probably inspired me the most to like, okay, maybe I can, maybe I should put myself out there like that. Um, part of it too was <clears throat> I was real, always really good at networking and talking to people and I was getting all these dope opportunities for the bands I was working for and they were blowing it and it was bumming me out because I had invested so much time and energy and I'm like I think I, I really just started Thieves that are Moneymakers out of a social experiment of like what happens if I take all this theater knowledge and singing and all this stuff and all these connections I made over the years and I don't say no to any opportunities I just charge it and I found out what happened. Like I killed it. <laughs> I killed yeah. it. I ended up on warp tour, you know, like within the first three years of the band, you know, be happening. And we were already crushing it in the jam band scene before that, mm -hmm. moving our way up on the festival lineup, you know? And, um, so what, what do you think was, was a couple things that you said yes to that really helped push you guys forward? Um, I had a really good relationship with House of Blues in Orlando because I had put on so many shows with them. And so, and they just like loved me as a person. When I said, Hey, I started a band, they didn't even question, they didn't even ask me if the band was good. Like, they were just <laughs> like, they're just like, Yeah, our first show was at House of Blues in yeah. Orlando, um, opening for the band I was managing at the time. And um, a, a local band called Junkie Rush, who it was the this Latin rock side project of the guitar player from the metal band death and that, that's the band that i manage and so we opened for that band and, and then i i kind of made a rule for myself like i was like okay for the first year i'm just gonna play everything you know like and i didn't start the band till i was like 20 something i won't date myself because i'm timeless and i'm not trying to go there but of course you're <laughs> um, young but not that young, not as young as like a lot of people yeah, no, are when they start bands. I started the band, people had bills to pay and rent and shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, hey guys, get in a van, let's go, you know? Right, so, yeah, life, real life issues happening. Yeah, so I really focused on our merch because I mm -hmm. knew that if I could crush it at merch, I could pay the band and I could say yes to everything and still guarantee my members their money, you know? Um, so that was kind of how I did everything and I was really good at marketing and branding and you know we had our first photo shoot before we ever played a show <laughs> like I was really <laughs> on it you know and um and then the thing you know I I really loved the jam band scene I loved going to those festivals I was inspired by the vibes particularly the spirit of Swanee Music Park which is in uh, like northern Florida um it was like the Allman Brothers had a festival there and um you know, all these different people. One of the owners of the festivals there was Judy and Melody Van Zant, who are the widow and daughter of Ronnie Van Zant from Leonard Skinner. They own mm -hmm. Freebirds in Jacksonville. So they had a few festivals out there too. And just the whole scene, it's like this magical place in the woods that has stages built into it. It's not like a, it doesn't feel like a, you know, your Coachella or like whatever festival that's set up in whatever land. It was like a magical place where they brought in art installations and there's hula hoopers and the fashion there was so dope. And I was just, yeah, this is the scene I want to be in. And I was seeing like, you know, Soul Alive and Lettuce and New Master Sound and Maceo Parker and all these bands <laughs> that were just inspiring the shit out of me. You know, I was yeah. like, and so I just grew, we just grew into that scene playing that. And, you know, everyone thinks that we're really a ska band, but all those costumes came from me eating mushrooms in the woods going, what do I want to see when I'm on mushrooms in the woods at a show? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love it. Okay. That, that explains so much. And I, yeah, yeah I yeah, feel so like, yeah. Okay. Mushrooms. I get it. Coincidence. <laughs> also, I, I, like I said, I was really into theater and the aesthetics of a, of a show looking really good. Like I grew up on parliament, George Clinton, parliament, Funkadelic and Sly Stone and like, they put on shows, you know, in the seventies, it was like a show, you know? And, um, so I was like, I want to put on these theatrical shows with a dope band, you know? And I had gotten us a sponsorship. I also, this was a crucial, crucial part of things too, was I'll give you the short version. While I was working at the tattoo shop doing body piercings, I was like 19 years old managing this tattoo shop and doing body piercings and, uh, it was a shop in Cocoa Beach. It was a super touristy shop, always busy. Long story short, I got arrested 
outside of the shop for selling pipes and bongs because they sold <laughs> pipes and bongs at the shop. And it was yeah. around the time when like Tommy Chong got arrested. So they were really cracking down on right. that time. It was like a gray area of the law. So I got handcuffed and shackled. And, Damn them. <laughs> um, it was pretty gnarly. And they thought I was the owner of the shop because the owners didn't even live in town. Like okay. So they thought like I was like this kingpin mm-hmm. like ordering pipes and bomb like dude i just work here you know but there's an undercover guy coming in like i need screens so i don't suck up any hot seeds i wasn't even listening half the time because i'm at the tourist shop it's busy it's spring break I'm right like, whatever it's like i need cleaner for my probation test i'm like you need this clean? whatever here you go okay you know, by the way like, don't tell the short version of this story keep going I, these oh. details are amazing and the fact that you had an undercover agent coming in as a customer yeah. and you got busted, like keep yeah. going. Like what else? Yeah. So what? I got, <laughs> I got, uh, this guy was coming in for months, you know, I guess. And I, I would always hook up the locals cause that's what kept us, you know, good during off season. So I'd always give him like good price, but he would come in when it was really busy and I'm like doing tattoo paperwork, piercing paperwork, doing piercings, answering the phone you know, scheduling the artists, like I'm just, and we also sold jewelry and pipes and bongs and whatever other shit, you know, that they sold at the shop. And so I'm just like slammed, not think, you're not paying attention. And so one day I come in with breakfast for everybody and all these agents show up and they're like, we have a warrant with your name on it. And you, the other guy that worked at the shop, they raided all the tattoo artist rooms they took all the pipes and bongs put me in handcuffs and shackles i have never been arrested in my life i was such a pussy about it. how did you feel like what happened it was terrifying like you must have been so scared they took me to straight to jail i'm crying the whole time like i don't even know why i'm here the guards at the jail are like stop crying or they're gonna fuck with you like you need to get it together and i'm like i'm not even like what did i do like i didn't even do anything so it turns out they try to charge me with um selling a substance to defraud urine which is a felony um sell sales and manufacturing of drug paraphernalia which were misdemeanors and my lawyer was like, look, you, you're in Florida. This is a very, you know, conservative state. Mm, yeah. You didn't really do any, you know, like whatever. They do have you recorded selling stuff to this guy after he made these sly statements that I wasn't paying attention to, which could make it look like I totally was aware of what was going on and sold him this stuff anyway or whatever. But he would just always say it under his breath. You know, like when I heard the recordings later, I'm like, I did not hear him say that, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, so I ended up, did they, did they, did they sit you down in an interrogation room and like show you tapes? Uh, no, but my lawyer, your lawyer kind of discovery. Yeah. And so he had heard all the tapes and had shown me some stuff and, uh, and, um, so he's like, look, you should do pretrial diversion, which is like basically voluntary probation so that you don't get convicted. And then it's just wiped away once you do this. You know, otherwise I was taking a chance going to trial and getting found guilty and being charged with a felony, you know, at 19 years old for some crazy Then shit. we'd be ro- doing this podcast by handwritten letter. Yeah. We wouldn't even prison. know each other. You know? Yeah, you're right. We That's true. We wouldn't even know each other, you know? <laughs> so yeah, through that, I had to do community <laughs> service. And my mom had a kidney transplant. She was one of the longest uh, surviving kidney transplant patients. She had Mm. it for over 30 years, which was a really big deal. And so I had already had intentions to start working with the National Kidney Foundation because they were based, they had an office in Cocoa Beach, but I hadn't gotten around to it because I was working a lot. And so on my list of community service I had to do was the National Kidney Foundation. I'm like, yes, okay, and now's my chance. So I started working with them. And I became their like um, sponsor. I would set up all their silent auctions and I, they would send me to Surf Expo, which was a surf trade show that happened every year in Orlando. And I would go there and talk to all the different companies to get sponsorships because they would throw a, a big pro-am surf contest in Cocoa Beach every year. And it, they would get sponsors and they'd raise money um, for the National Kidney Foundation. And so that became my, my job with them. And I stayed working with them for years after that. Um, but hmm. through going to Surf Expo, I met Sector 9 and Vans and Lawn Zipper and all these like surf and skate brands and became friends with them and then uh, started my band. And I, when I started the band, I'd be like, hey, do you guys want to sponsor my band? And they're like, yeah, Bees, we love you. Let's we'll see this band. And like, <laughs> this is dope. Well, yeah, we're down, you know. And so I started getting all these sponsorships for the band. And 
one of the guys that I had made friends with um, was Bob Provost, who's still like one of my dear friends. He's like Steve Van Doren's right hand man at Vans, and he was always out on Warp Tour, and he he ran the trade shows as well. And I remember after I started the band, I'm like Bob, how do I get on the Warp Tour? And he was like, I don't know, like I have nothing to do with that actually, but um, you know, good luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll give you shoes. I love you, but I don't have anything to do with that. And literally, um, the next year, we were playing uh, the Allman Brothers Festival, Wani, at Spirit of Swanee Music Park. And House of Blues had called me and said, hey, we're sponsoring a stage for the Florida Music Festival, which is like Orlando's version of South by Southwest, basically. There's like keynote speakers and stuff. And um, I knew that Kevin Lyman was one of the keynote speakers. He was already like my music business hero long before I ever met him, you know? And um, so I... They're like, the bad news is we have no budget to pay you. But the good news is it's like a prime slot, headlining spot on the outdoor stage. There's going to be a lot of people there. And, you know, it'll be a good place, you know, for you to get exposure outside of, of you know, the scene here. And I was like, okay. My band at the time was very much into doing these jam band festivals and staying all weekend and eating mushrooms and raging and going to watch all of our favorite jam bands. Sure, of <laughs> and course. So I'm like, hey guys, um, House of Blues wants it. It doesn't pay, but it's going to be dope. They're like, fuck no, we're not doing it. And, and there's I'm no like, mushrooms? Not- <laughs> what? And there's no mushrooms? Yeah, yeah, there's like, they're like, we're not leaving the sick festival in the middle of the woods to go play to a bunch of Budweiser drinking douchebags in the middle of the street in downtown Orlando. And I was like, what? I was like, okay. And I was just straight got gangster on. I was like, well, if you don't play, I'll find a new band to play Wani with me. And that's it. Like I'll find, cause it was only a couple of them that were really giving me shit about it. it wasn't everybody <laughs> in the band. Put the... um, but they were putting up a fight. Like it was everybody in the band. Um, yeah. So I said, uh, I-, I have a good relationship with house of blues. I was like down and, you know, I'd do it up for, for them. We've always looked out for each other. They've always been super rad to me. And um, so I told them like, if you don't play this show, you're not playing this this festival with me so thank you your poison <laughs> and so they reluctantly left the festival early everyone's pissed at me right they're all <laughs> yeah. mad that they have to leave this epic festival to go play <laughs> in downtown orlando and uh i get for free and i get there and it's like 100 percent chance of rain i'm hauling ass from the festival i've already missed kevin's kevin lyman's keynote speech so i'm super bummed I get there, it's like 100% chance of rain. Our show is probably going to get rained out, which means I'm going to just get my ass chewed by the band because they're going to be like, they left. <sighs> so um, I, at the time, we had these LED hula hoopers that were part of all of our shows. Like we had this LED hula hoop parade that would lead into the show and they dance on stage with us. And so that's another conversation. You have to call them up and be like, hey, can you be in Orlando for free tomorrow at this time? Tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> no, they were already there. They're always Oh, okay, down. good. They were always the <laughs> shout out to all the hula hoopers that ever played with Beeves and our money makers because it was always for free. They just wanted to dance and be on stage and, and they how were do, all so dope. How do you find people that are willing to dance for free with hula hoops? That's a gift. The jam band, the jam band scene, because those girls are okay. paying to go to the festival just to hoop. It's a different scene. Band. I get it. It's a okay. Scene. It's okay. A different, it's a different thing. It's different values. It's a very fringe thing, you know. <laughs> um, okay, so it's 100% so, chance of rain. 100% chance of rain. And the hula hoopers come up to me and they're like, Beats, we did an anti rain dance. I was like, okay, <laughs> sounds right. great. They like they took their hula hoops and did some witchy shit. I don't know what they did. But, um, they literally it went the two bands before us had already been canceled because of rain literally they're about to cancel us and right before our set it went down like 10 percent chance of rain and stopped raining we played our set crushed it and then kevin lyman came up to me as i'm coming off stage was like hey i'm kevin lyman i think you guys are the next no doubt i want you on all of work tour next year and i was like i know exactly who you are that sounds rad Let's go. <laughs> oh, that is insane. That I mean, yeah. that that's that's like move like that happens in the movies, you know. Yeah. That's yeah, crazy. It's not even a real thing. Daddy Warbucks you know? just came <laughs> Yeah, Daddy Warbucks just showed up and took a little orphan Annie, you know. <laughs> like, bro, it was dope. And that is so, such an amazing story. And yeah. It turns out the two members that gave me the most shit about playing that show didn't even come on Warp Tour with me. <laughs> they they ended up quitting before Warp Tour and I got new people. So, um, shout outs to that. Um, I mean, so, yeah, the right people ended up, you know, on the tour. 
yeah, so I end up seeing Bob at Surf Expo because at this time now I'm playing for all I'm playing all these Surf Expo after parties that with these that mm. are money makers for all these brands, Sector Nine, Von Zipper, Snook, all these different brands. And I see Bob and I go, Hey Bob, he goes, Beeps, I just saw Kevin in Hawaii and you're on all of Warp Tour. Like, what? How did that happen? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I have no like, idea. What? So cool, you know? And um part of that too, I have like while I was uh at Surf Expo, I have linked with another company called Loudmouth Golf, and they make crazy golf pants. And I'm like, yeah, I want to style the band. I had already had them in like some kind of matching thing, but they made these crazy pants. I was like, yeah, I want the band to rock those. And so they sent us, they sponsored us and sent us all these different patterns. And I'm thinking, you know, from a production side, like what pattern is the most bold from far away? Because I'm thinking Warped Tour, like the you know, kids could be fun. Like what's the most bold? And it was Checkerboard. So... Just so happens that my friend Cooley Ranks from Pilfers introduced me to Real Big Fish because he was on tour with Real Big Fish right before our first work tour. I go to see him and um, he's like, oh, let me introduce you to the Real Big Fish. Like, you're going to be on work tour with them next year. So they were like, we, they were like my only friends going into work tour. I didn't know anybody on the tour because by this time, the whole scene had changed. I didn't know anything about screamo or emo or hardcore i i didn't you know what i mean like that's yeah. what predominantly warped tour was a, when, by the time we were on it we were like the, us real big fish red gold green and like a couple other bands were like the weirdos of warped tour like do you remember what year that fish. was uh 2013 was oh Fish's okay tour. wow so um so yeah i <clears throat> that's how like so we're wearing checkerboard yeah we made, real big fish are only friends going into it Funk is not working. We start playing Scott, you know, some switch all the songs kind of to ska vibe. And that was kind of my MO too. It was like, no matter what festival we played, whether it was with reggae bands or jam bands, I always catered the set to at least a few songs to fit that demographic. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, playing the same songs, just stylistically switching it up, throwing a one drop in or, you know, uh, making more jammy or whatever. That's so cool. That's kind of, how I would always morph into all yeah. these different scenes. That is and, really uh, interesting, Beebs, actually. You have to find musicians that can do that, that can, like, yeah. change their style up. Because it's not easy just to, like, go to a reggae vibe if you're all you've played in the past is just punk or something. Yeah. Well, I put the band together <laughs> by... It started with just me and my guitar player. We started the band and wrote the songs. And then... I had been in the music industry for a while working with all these different bands and I had some bands that were my favorites that had broken up since and there's certain players that I was just like, they're such a dope bass player, they're such a dope drummer. So I just started like, yo, a lot of these, they, their bands had broken up. So I just started like handpicking all my favorite players from bands that I used to work with that weren't playing anymore and yeah. kind of started for, and everyone had a sub. So there's always like, I just had a plethora of amazing musicians, you know, and I always have around me, you know, like, so uh, it was pretty cool. And um, so, yeah, that's how kind of everything morphs. So from, you know, getting arrested into, <laughs> yeah. into finding my niche in sponsorship world, into applying that to my band, into, you know, that working out, that's how I funded my whole career. Like I didn't have, I never had money to like put out records or, you know, do any of this stuff, but I knew that I really wanted to do it. And I knew that it was possible if I believed in it enough. I could get other people to believe in it. And the company is all just like my energy. And we're like down, like these are so sweet. Like, and you just got this good energy. Like we're down to sponsor, you know? So our first year at Warped Tour, you know, it's like 60 grand up front to do work Tour between the bus mm -hmm. and paying my band and merch and all this stuff and recording records. So I ended up doing a sponsorship deal our first year with Ripley's Believe It or Not. <laughs> and okay. so they, they gave me a grip of cash and I co-branded everything with them because in my mind, like the whole premise of Beebs and our moneymakers or what I had built was that we were superheroes. That was the mythology of the band and we had our own comic book. And this yeah, whole thing. you were ahead of the game because that's huge now. I was, but. dude, I'm always ahead. Yeah, now yeah. I'm like over all that <laughs> and on some other shit. You know? well, yeah. Meanwhile, everyone's jacked the wave now, you know? Like, Damn it. Yeah, just bring back the um, superhero costume. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, so... Ripley, Ripley, believe it or not, how does so? Okay, that's so Our outside. My office is in is in Orlando. Okay, so you you had a relationship with somebody that worked there, and they would hire us to play their events 
or mm, whatever. Mm, they'd yeah. have us, they'd have the lizard man, they'd have Enigma, the puzzle guy, all the oddities, you know? Right, we you're like, the oddity. Weird, <laughs> weird music band. <laughs> we were band. like a circus band, like we looked like a circus, yeah. you know what I mean? So that we would play with them, or play for them, and I was like, realized like their whole branding message was celebrating oddities right and our whole thing was celebrating being your own superhero like what, however weird you came like we accept you be mm -hmm. weird like let your freak flag fly so to me the two brands like totally went together because we're just celebrating like being different you know and and just being yourself and so we uh i worked on it for months you know and, and this deal with them and yeah. that with their president and i was like also i'm like also as part of the deal, we'll shoot a music video in your facilities, which I know as a production person, that would usually cost a lot of money, but they never partnered with the band before. So like, you will? I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> sure, you pay for it. <laughs> so, they, so they shut down. Well, we st we shot, uh, which video was it? For Jumpin', uh, we shot inside Ripley's from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. two nights in a row, which was gnarly. It was really creepy, too, actually. You're in there with all those weird artifacts. They got energy or something, but there were yeah. times when I was like, I'm not walking down that hallway by Mummies. myself. Someone come with me. That show was that that show was big when I was a kid. Like, I remember w watching that, that yeah, TV show. Yeah, with Dean Kane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, at this time, Dean Kane wasn't doing the show anymore. I'm like, y'all need help branding. I got you. Yeah, <laughs> you know I mean? new like, host. I got you. So I wrapped our vehicle. We ended up bringing out a bunch of artifacts from Ripley's, believe it or not. Um, like we brought a two-headed stuffed cow, some shrunken heads, some other weird oddities. And I also didn't have, you know, I didn't have a lot. I didn't know a lot of the bands on Warped Tour. And I was nervous too, you know, like, oh, what am I? This is so exciting. But ah. so I ended up making my, we made our own uh, TV show called BAM TV. And it was like, mm -hmm. when I would go to sign up for press at Warped Tour every day, I would, I would do my interviews, but then I would sign up as our own press and interview other bands to get to know other bands. And we would incorporate all the artifacts from Ripley's in with it. So it, it made them happy. And we're always shouting them out. You over you over delivered for Ripley's for sure. Like yeah, they must have been true. like, oh my gosh, like this is so, I mean, they probably didn't even realize how, how hard it is to get artists to actually give them things to use for their their branding but you over delivered but so you did a podcast basically kind of maybe not necessarily a full-length podcast but you were basically kind of doing interviews with bands just to mm -hmm. and you would record them did you put them out yeah, they're all on youtube you can go to these are my Bam youtube channel we did it with uh aquabats with real big fish with uh new year's day uh, Echo Smith, all these different, all the bands that we were on tour with at the time. And um, Real Big Fishes is actually my favorite one because I also <laughs> had a friend who had a soap company, some other products, and she wanted me to get it out first. So I, she gave me all this stuff. So I made gift bags. So also, when you did an interview with us, you got a gift bag with like soap and all this other stuff in it, which everyone loved. And my friend was stoked about it. And then when I did the Real Big Fish one, Aaron ate the soap. It's like, oh, chocolate, mm. ate it. <laughs> and it was like this funny moment and it totally like helped blow her company up. And like, you know, it was, I, I was always using my community and my resources to like, how am I just going to make more art? How am I just mm -hmm. going to keep fueling this, you know, never ending dream of just making art every day, you know? Yeah. And um, so, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's the story of how we got to Warp Tour and how, you know, getting arrested and doing charity work and community service and, linking with all these brands happened. It was a wild ride. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> wild ass ride. Yeah. So. Just, I, I'm still, I mean, all of those details are, are insane, but I'm fixated on the fact that you signed up, did press, but then also signed up to do press for other bands. Or it's and just something that I, I thought of doing and then just never did because I was too lazy. To be honest, yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I couldn't have done it without our drummer because um, <laughs> But seriously, it's so good, man. Like, it's such a great a, idea. My video editor, you know what I mean? So he would edit, he would edit, he would film and edit everything. Um, so shout out Paul Brisky. He's, he works for Stevo now. He does all Stevo's. <laughs> nice. Shout videos. out. What He's up? Killing it. Yeah. Um, I mean, just the yeah, fact so, that you guys actually did it is amazing because it's uh, thinking as an artist doing that tour, it is 
insanely tiring and to do press is kind of like annoying because you're like, all right, I'm already doing this, 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 and now I got to go and then sit. And innings and then trying to find time to eat. And that yes. first year we drove ourselves. So actually I didn't rent a bus that first tour. I rented a, what was it called? A rocket ship. Okay. Which was a sprinter with bunks in it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it had five bunks and two couches. There were seven of us, including our merch guy. So we lived in a sprinter, seven of us, for three months, driving ourselves. I pretty much lived off five-hour energy drink. Oh, I bet. Did you rotate sleeping uh, bunks, or did, did everybody have their own space always? Everyone had their own space. Okay, then, that's good. Um, Somebody got stuck merch, with a couch, though. The merch guy. Okay. <laughs> that's always the merch, the merch guy. The merch guy got stuck with the couch. Yeah. You know? Shout out to Phil. Like, he was a trooper. He, and he would, and he'd be, he was the perfect merch guy, too, because our whole merch booth looked like a circus tent and we had carnival games. And like I said, we had the two headed cow and all this like crazy stuff you could look at to keep people engaged. And he would always be on the megaphone, like come get a signing from Biebs and our money makers. Their drummer once peed next to Obama in a bathroom in Topanga. Like, you know, he would just say <laughs> the most random shit yeah. to like get people engaged. He was just the most uh, amazing guy. And actually he drove all the, he, he makes, He's so pumped. He makes bases now and strings for some company in Nashville. Drove all the way to my show in Florida a few weeks ago and was like, Beeps, I just had to see you guys play and tell you thank you for getting me started in the music industry. And I'm working in Nashville and like doing all this stuff. And by the way, here's some strings I made for you in Norwood. And you Amazing. Know, like, I'm going to build you a base, you know, so quick. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, a, oh, let's hold up. That's not the only thing that happened. Okay. On top of that, two weeks before we leave for Warp Tour, Kevin Lyman's like, we're filming this Warp Brody's TV show. You're going to be one of the characters on it. And I was like, what? I was like, no, I don't want to. I'm a pretty <laughs> private person outside of like, you know, I'll, I'll rock my costume and do my thing. But um, everyone thinks I'm super outgoing. And maybe I was when I drank. But now that I don't drink anymore, I don't only smoke weed, I'm not the most like social. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, and I have always had severe social anxiety and crowds and stuff since I was a kid. And so I was like, what? I don't want to be on a TV show. That's too much. I'm good. How did they He's sell like, it no. to you? How did they sell it? He did it. He just told me that it was happening. You're doing too it. Late. They're already coming to Florida <laughs> to film you before the tour. They're filming your show at Beecham Theater. And because we were doing our album release right before we were leaving. It's like, they're filming the show and they're coming to your house. Well, I had already moved out of my house and put all my shit in storage because I knew I was going to be gone for three months. And I didn't know what was going to happen after that. So Perfect. I was like, um, you guys can come to my dad's house, I guess. So they showed up to my dad's house. And my dad is probably one of the best comedians of all time. He's just the funniest guy. And my mom had just passed away like a couple years before this. And so the production company comes to his house and I have this really gnarly high school picture. I'm actually wearing an MXPX shirt in this high school picture. Oh, I have to see that. You have to send me that. It's a, it was a yellow shirt with like rings on the sleeves. And it said, why can't my boyfriend be an MXPX? Yeah. yeah, That's cartoon girl on it. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, that's crazy. What a wildlife. Anyway. So, (laughs) um, so this, this really, I was really fat in high school and definitely a weird kid. I wore wild a lot of weird clothes still you know and I was picked on all the time and so this time I'm like 200 pounds this picture of me and I like have my hair in these two buns I just look like complete psycho and so they find this picture the production company finds this picture and shows it to my dad and they're like what do you think about this picture of your daughter and he goes I think that's the picture that gave her mom cancer (laughs) I'm like we're all like oh my god dude too soon they're dying laughing my dad's just making he's just so crazy and morbid he just doesn't give a fuck and so yeah they came and interviewed me and my dad and whatever and then they followed me the whole tour you know Mm -hmm. like and it's a tv show it's a docuseries but they're just trying to capture things anything they're trying to make storylines they're trying to capture things at one point, I remember getting really mad at them because they kept making me want to reenact things that had already happened. I'm like, look, dude, I'm not here to be a monkey in your show. I have literally 25 minutes to prove myself to every town I'm in, and I don't have time for this. So I didn't talk to them for like two days because I'm like, this is just too much. It's my first year of Warped Tour. I'm already doing a, basically a TV show, like my own like interview TV show. 
and doing all this stuff, trying to fulfill sponsor needs. And now I have to be a monkey in someone else's TV show. And like, and I just refuse to, you know, like really cater to them too much. Mm. Um, but it all worked out in the long run. You know, they, they all are still my friend. All the production people are still my friends. They've done some of my music videos since then. It all worked out, you know. But that TV show by then we did work toward the second year because the TV show is like I was getting mobbed by kids. If I if I was in my costume, if I wasn't in my costume, no one could tell because I would wear these big eyelashes and all these hair extensions and all this makeup. So if I was just rolling around haggard, like no one noticed. That I was there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> early morning <laughs> warp tour. <laughs> yeah, but as soon as I put that costume on, I was like, it was really overwhelming. You know, I, I have to say, like, it was crazy. You know, I came from the jam band scene of like, you know these crazy insane musicians to warp tour. That was the first time I really had seen or experienced people playing the tracks. And there were some bands on there that were just fully playing the tracks, like right. completely. And I remember being so mad. I was like, went up to Kevin. And I was like, how can you allow this song to work? <laughs> <laughs> with big ass bands. Like I was like, so upset. what did he say? Like I, he was like, that's just the way it is. Beeps. That's just the way it is. And I was like, I the can't times. get down with this because I was used to like, playing a festival and watching all these other bands and then g going home hating myself, right? Because right. their bands are so good. And it pushed me to like be better. You know, I I like hating things, hating what I did or really like picking my shit apart based mm. on some other inspiration I saw. Um, so yeah, it was, and it sucked because you got a seven piece band, right? We have a seven piece band. We're super tight. We're as tight as we can possibly be. And this other band's always going to sound bigger and tighter than us because they're playing tracks. the tracks. See, that's the <laughs> difference like, is that ah! it's not. It's it's people people have different likes and dislikes. And, and some people really prefer the real thing. And some people yeah. never heard the real thing. And they're like, no, I like this. But if they heard the real thing, then they'd be like, wait, I kind of like that better. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. those kids didn't know whether the... They, they probably don't even know that they're it. playing the tracks. That's the no, thing. No, no, not at but, all. But, like these girls are throwing bras and panties at bands <laughs> that aren't even playing. I'm like, my friends are running monitors. Like this is my favorite band to run monitors for. I don't have to do shit. The whole yeah, like, it's <laughs> dialed great. done. You well, know? so you were talking about you know your merch guy being a, a carnival barker, and just by the time you guys were doing Warp Tour, to be honest, like so many things had changed in the music business, in the industry, with you know, bands, but I don't think, I don't think people knew quite like when we started doing warped, it was 97. That was our first year. And it was a carnival atmosphere, but like it took, you know, a decade for like all the industry people and the people that work the tour to like figure out, Oh, this is what we should do. Let's get crazy. And you guys kind of, you kind of intrinsically kind of knew that coming in just boom we have to be big because you you do you did in that era especially you kind of had to do you had to be extra extra crazy and, and viral videos were definitely a thing at that point yeah. and, and so yeah I mean, I mean I think Instagram had just come out on that tour Spotify wasn't a thing yet for sure um, right yeah even since we toured on Warped Tour so many things have changed like, right but through Warped Tour I ended up doing a podcast show in 2014 I had a podcast on Adobe radio for a year. Um, and then I was like, well, this is a lot of work. <laughs> it is a lot of work, isn't it? Every I'm week, like, was it so a weekly love. show? I have so much love for all my friends that have, we had a, we actually had a live stream and we had a live stream show called BAM TV that we would do through Ustream every week. And then we also had, the, I had the Adobe radio podcast. So again, yeah, you were kind back, of, I was like, man, I was so ahead. Yeah, exactly way ahead I remember how much work it was i think about it now everyone's like you should start a podcast i'm like i'm good i'll just do everyone else <laughs> yeah <laughs> a lot of work it is a lot of work I, I started this in 2013 and there's been one sort of hiatus where i took a couple months off but i was yeah. i was always planning to like i was like i'm gonna chill just need a break but i'm gonna bring it back uh you know it's it's fun but you you always seem to be just one step ahead of everyone so what's what's next like what What's new? Well, what's next? What What do you, you don't have to predict anything, but what are you into? So I had finished a record. Um, I was actually getting ready to release a record last year. Helium, we actually shot that video 
the day everyone's tour started getting canceled. Okay. Shout out to G Love for holding the vibe down because as we're filming the video, it's like Canada's mm. canceled, New York's canceled. Like he's we, just getting we, texts. We, yeah. We probably should canceled. cancel this. <laughs> yeah. We didn't know that was going to be our last like get together for a long time, you know? Yeah. Um, But I, we filmed all that in my backyard. I just threw a barbecue and like made the sets that day. You know, G was playing the belly up, which is right by my house. So I was like, let's, we both do art as well. And we had a, um, we have, we're both going to be showing art at this other festival beach life um, last year. And so we're like, also let's make this a day to like finish our art for this art show that we at this festival. So, um, so, and then I had also gotten offered to go on tour with Bootsy Collins and who's like one of my heroes. Oh yeah. You know? And so all this stuff. So was what happening. are you, what were you going to do? Tour manage or what? Like some, no, he was building a tour and I was going to be one of the singers. Oh, and I whoa. was going to do my songs. Norwood was going to be the, ba- Norwood's side project, Trulio Disgracious was going to be the backing band for it. I okay. was going to be one of the singers and a couple other a couple other chicks and Bootsy was going to host. And there was also going to be a comedy factor in, in this. Do you just show. ever wake up and go, what is my life that like Bootsy yeah, Collins day. is like every freaking day. I'm like, what is this? Am I dreaming? Am I awake? I don't know. Norwood, so Bootsy Collins. I met Bootsy at NAM last year, the last year. Yeah. Last year. And, um, I was, um, task is one of my sponsors. And so I was there playing for them. And I had to go do an interview and I walked into my interview and he was finishing his up and I walked in and I was like, I'm so sorry. They're like, no, you're on time. We're just running over. We love your fashion. And I happen to have my manager <laughs> and my publicist with me at the time. who are both just my friends, you know, like they're, sure. they're my homies, you know, they also do a great job, but I don't have like this crazy team, team of people. <laughs> I have my homies who play those roles and are super dope at them. But that was kind of my whole thing is like, I never wanted to grow up in the industry and not have my friends around, you know, mm-hmm. and people that didn't care about me, you know, really. So um, anyway, they're with me and Garrett, I will probably cut a video eventually, but Garrett had the GoPro rolling of my reaction the whole time, like sneakily while we're in the room. And they're like, it's just Bootsy and his wife and the camera crew. And they're like, we love your fashion. And I was like, mine, like you're my fashion hero, <laughs> music hero, fashion hero. I don't know what. And they're like, we've been looking to do a clothing line. And I don't even know what to say. I can barely talk in the moment. I don't really get starstruck often because I've lived a crazy life. But this was like one of those moments where I was like speechless, like, oh. And my publicist is like, oh, well, she, you know, she has a clothing line. She could totally do a clothing line. I was like, oh, okay. And so <laughs> then we, I'm already talking to them about that and now this tour and then COVID happens. And so they're like, we still want to move forward with this uh, clothing collab. Let's do a, let's do a one-off collab piece. Um, You know, make some artwork of Bootsy and this is the vibe we're going for. This is the picture we want to base it off of. So I end up doing that painting and turning it into, uh, to, into the shirt. I actually did that painting while me and G love were like the next day after the video, I started working on that painting while we were on our art day. Dope. And, um, yeah, because Bootsy released a new album called Power of the One, and uh, that that got released as a limited release for the new album, and uh, it was dope. Like all of a sudden, there's pictures of Flea and all these people wearing my shirt that I made for him. Yeah, I'm like, what the fuck is my life? This is insane. That is insane. And, uh, You're a Renaissance woman, you know. You yeah. you paint, <laughs> you you build things, you 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 get out there and you connect people to people and and you made this brand of this band and you were on this TV show. I mean, yeah, you, you're doing everything. And and then aside from all that songwriting, the voice amazing. Yeah. I think, I think I knew that about you. Like we've, we've hung out quite a bit, you know, uh, jammed, but like I always saw the music side of you. We didn't really talk business and I didn't really, I, I knew you were a hustler, but like, man, this is, and you've even been on this podcast before, but getting into this, it's, uh, I'm blown away. I'm very, very impressed. Highly impressed. Thanks, man. Yeah, I, when, thank you for letting me talk about all this stuff. Cause honestly, I have to compartmentalize all the facets of myself because when it comes to the music industry, people kind of have tunnel vision. And yeah. most of the time, especially because I'm in so many different scenes, the reggae scene, the jam band scene, warp tour, whatever, you know. You don't want to confuse when people. I, you just want to give them yeah. what they're used to. Well, yeah. when I start opening up, when I have meetings with people and I'm like, they're like, oh, what are you doing? I tell them everything. They're like, 
you're the most unfocused person I've ever, like, it's too much. You know, they think that I'm unfocused and they think that I, you know, they, they want to see me in one genre doing one thing mm -hmm. and that's it. They're like, how do you have, because I also have a production company with my, with my business partner. We do music videos and live streams and stuff for other bands and other people. And so, and commercials and whatever. But, um, you know, they're like, we don't want to invest in you because you're unfocused. And I'm like, all to me, all of it goes together. The clothing goes into the brand, into the video content, into the everything. In my mind, and maybe that's just my crazy superhero ADHD mind <laughs> that yeah. says like, all this shit goes together. I don't know why you guys don't get it, you know? So I learned a long time ago that I had to, A, compartmentalize and hide parts of myself um, when I'm talking to people so they don't get so overwhelmed by me. And B, um, you know, just not, people don't need to know that I do all these things. Sure. Cause I, I learned a long time ago, you know, I would get invited to a lot of meetings and I'd be I'd always be like, why are they inviting me to this meeting? It's so nice. I'm always usually the only female there too, you know, I'm like, this is so cool. And then I started realizing, oh, they're, they're getting all my ideas. Cause I would see, I would like just be bullshit and talking about stuff and then boom a year later they're doing it and i'm like they didn't mm. even involve me that's kind of fucked up but i realized that it's a gift i have a lot of ideas and a lot of creativity that live in my brain and it just comes out effortlessly because i i always think outside the box because that's just how my brain works but in a very business way and i realized i'm really blessed to be surrounded by so many people that can take my ideas and instantly man like I couldn't I couldn't possibly manifest all my ideas in one lifetime so it's cool that I'm always in a circle of people I don't need the credit for things I truly just love producing the world around me and the life around me and I think that's really connecting people and watching projects happen that's the production person in me you know what I mean that just really loves to just see the show happen it's like when you make a festival or you make a show you spend a lot of time working on it and then it's over in the blink of an eye. But the joy that you really got from it was the logistics of making it happen and then seeing how happy it made people. And it doesn't really matter that anyone knows that you were the lighting guy or you were the production part. You know, you just take pride in that you you and your team put that together and made it happen. So you I know, love that I, attitude, by the way, the, the the focus on making something rather than making yeah. something for the credit of making something. Yeah, because eventually, dude, in a hundred years, no one may know my name or yeah. any of my music or anything I accomplished, but I think the most important thing in life is to inspire people and show them things that are possible, right? We're living in a world where obviously we live in a fucked up society. I'll, and it's not, most artists know that. That's why we live on the fringes of society and make our own path and stuff. Cause we're like, this shit's crazy. I don't want to subscribe or I just can't function in this space. You know, I find like, me and a lot of my friends are very much on the spectrum. <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Like, and that's okay. That's it's okay. A superpower to me. You know Absolutely. I mean? But um, we know how to act normal when we need to. <laughs> when we, I'm still, I got, I got barriers to that too. I'm like, Garrett, you do the meeting. I can't guarantee I'm not going to drop an f bomb in this meeting. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But um, now, before I used to have to hold it together a lot more. Now yeah. I just take pride in just being weird and just living in my own universe. But you've made it this um, far. Yeah, you're. I all made right. it this far, you know. <laughs> so I think this I, over the years, I've really, especially that TV show, was good for me to do because it showed me what I didn't want. Like fame is a weird thing. It's I don't know that the human psyche can handle that much of admiration without fucking you up to a certain extent, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I know right. a lot of really famous people and they're not the happiest of people. And it's because they're basically in jail. They can't go anywhere without people constantly coming up to them or wanting to take pictures or whatever, whatever. And although people think that that's cool, it's like your life's not really your own. And you start become having to be on all the time, which is really exhausting. We're all just human beings. We're all just people we all go through the same thing. We go through family deaths. We go through family drama. We go through our own emotion, right? Range of emotions, depression, whatever, anxiety. And most artists I know have depression and anxiety are quite heavier than most. That's where all the art comes from. You know, people think like literally all music is made from the plight of living. 
you know yeah like jazz music came from the plight of black americans like like i hate when people are like ah, just stick to music don't talk about politics and that's like it is all of that that's what art is you know and people don't it's not here just for your own entertainment although it may appear that way you know it's for our sanity to understand this world and to get it out and to figure out what the fuck we're experiencing and hopefully relate to other people but eventually all those things fade away and i think that's why childhood act actors have such a hard time because when you peak and people love you so much mm -hmm. you, it's almost impossible to maintain that level of um success forever you know like, right. for the rest of your career and so then you get depressed because you're you you're kind of your whole validity in life was like people admiring you or you know whatever you know really loving your shit and we have to learn to love ourselves before we can really rely on people big upping us on our own stuff, you know, because it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous emotional game to play. And so this last year, I mean, I've been, my friends started a, an organization called the sidewalk project and it was started in the punk rock community. And I've been working with them for a little over three years now. And um, it started on the premise of bringing art and music to houseless communities. The homeless communities we usually okay. houseless because homeless has a bad stigma and sure. people just need to remember that that is someone's home but they just don't have a house you know what i mean mm -hmm. like wherever they're living is their home how so, do you how do you bring music to houseless the houseless community so before covid mm -hmm. we were going it started in skid row and we were going down there and los angeles it with, yeah it's yeah, insane down there it's like a mile long or more no, blocks and blocks, blocks and blocks. We're talking like over 60,000 people unhoused, you know? That's insane. In the fifth largest economy in the world, in one of the richest cities, sur Skid Row is literally surrounded by empty high rises. It's disgusting. It's just the most gross display of capitalism you could ever witness, you know? Um, but my friend Stacy D from Bad Cop, Bad Cop, and Soma Snake Oil, and Emily Nielsen of Punk Rock Paintbrushes started this. They all had, a, had their battles with addiction or homelessness themselves mm -hmm. and had started uh, this organization. And so it started with Stacy and uh, Jeff from the AgriLites and Johnny from Old Man Merkley. They would go down and they would learn covers and they would just play for people to sing, you know, just people just get out. Cause we think, okay, if I don't have art supplies or a way to make art, I will 100% lose my mind. Right. There's a lot of talented artists and people down in the streets and what a great way to connect with people through music and art. And I, I always love, you know, being of service, but I don't always love that that comes with like a religion all the time. Like I'll be of service to you. If you listen to all of my beliefs, like not about my beliefs right now, it's about me showing up for somebody else. And so that's always been, not that those organizations aren't great and don't do a lot of work but for me personally i needed to be able to work with people outside of a, a religious affiliation because i respect everyone's religion in all walks of life and i don't like to just push my own ideas on people in order to access for them to access services or help mm -hmm. you know so um you know and we would bring art supplies and do murals with the community and food, clean food, good, good. food. Um, you know, cause that's the other thing people don't think about. It's like, Oh, I brought a cheeseburger to a homeless guy today. It's like, that's not the food that that person needs. Yeah. You know, it's like what you're putting into your body is also affecting your mental health. It's also affecting how your body's functioning. And so, although that's a really sweet thing to do to make sure someone has food, maybe if you need it, they need it. You know what I mean? If you're drinking fresh juices and drinking alkaline water, they need it too. And maybe more because they're in right. like maybe not the best <clears throat> mental headspace. They mm -hmm. need the most nutrients and the most, you know, um, the greatest stuff. So, so, so uh, did these artists go down and um, play and then the, the houseless people sing the homeless houseless. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, they, sing, they, they sing, they sing, they yeah. sing along. So yeah, like, they're, they're like, great. Oh yeah, I want to, I used to sing. And then they yeah, there's this great, so the okay. first video I saw, um, you guys can go search it on YouTube. If you type in radio sidewalk project, there's a woman named radio and she lives down in Skid Row and it's a video of Stacy, Johnny and Jeff jamming with her and she sings at last and she sings. Oh my God. It makes me want to cry. Just talking about her voice. It gives me chills. Mm. Every time I watch it, I like tear up. It's so powerful because she, she's kind of down and as soon as she starts singing, it's like, a whole different person, you know what I mean? As soon as yeah. you bring out the creative 
I've had some of the sickest jam sessions I've ever had in my life in the streets of Skid Row because it's, I love going down there because it's just human to humans, you know, like there's a lot of different people. Um, Soma is a, a dominatrix, so she fights for sex worker rights. Stacy's a musician. Emily um, is uh, uh, sober and, and, and runs an art, you know, mm -hmm. community. So there's all these different people. So a lot of people that follow Soma into Sidewalk Project are porn stars, former porn stars, current sex workers, the people that follow Stacy and are musicians, the people that follow Emily and are usually in recovery or just getting sober. And so we have, you know, a lot of trans people in the community too. And so when we're in the streets, I love it because no one's asking each other what their politics are, what their religion are, what their gender is. It's just people having human connection. No one gives a shit about my achievements or accomplishments. I don't care to tell anyone. And you know what I mean? Like, it's just real human moments and real human connection and just showing up and being a good neighbor. I don't, the amount of, the amount of, of gifts the streets have given me hanging out and talking to people and really listening to people's stories and just connecting with people through music has given me more than I feel like I could really ever give back. It's taught me not to, it's taught me no judgment. You know, I, we also do a needle exchange. So I've been helping with the needle exchange in the last few months too, which has given me a whole new perspective for the, you know, for mm -hmm. the addiction community. And it's so amazing to watch people who are struggling with their own things um get it together enough to go oh i need to get clean supplies and show up for themselves that's called self-care that's real self-care and i have the most amazing conversations with people and i've done mushrooms and acid enough times to know that the things they're saying to me aren't crazy they just see through veils and i could see where you know uh, a guy on some drugs telling a businessman walking through the streets like his visions and what he's the perspective he's seeing the world through that guy's like that guy's crazy they tell me i'm like you're not crazy i feel you <laughs> like, I yeah. totally, i hear you you know what i mean and right and i think sh just showing up for people with no judgment mm -hmm. like i'm not judging anyone who's you know since when did having dirt on us make us less human since when did not having access to a shower make us like you know not a part of society since like how, why is it that a doctor can prescribe you Xanax and Prozac and whatever other drugs. And you can openly talk about it with your friends. Like, Hey girl, yeah, I'm on Prozac and Zoloft now, but someone who is self-medicating in the streets can't talk about it because they're judged for it. Like mm -hmm. to me, it's all the same, you know what I mean? And so I've found, you know, a lot of, a lot of love and a lot of growth and a lot of learning um, from the streets and you know, I'm just so tired of people sitting around bitching on Facebook about the world that they hate so much. It's like, okay, we'll do something. You know what I mean? And something in this case isn't a lot. Give someone your time. Talk to someone. You know, like say hi. That's what it taught really taught me. It taught me to see everybody. You know, mm -hmm. I remember there was a time, especially when I was living in Orlando, we have a block there, Pine Street. There's a lot of homeless homeless on, on Pine Street. And uh I would always talk to the people that made art and stuff and buy art from them, but I would get overwhelmed because I was a struggling musician. They asked me for money and I would just run by. I don't have any money. I'm a musician. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. Like run away. And, um, I know exactly how now, you feel. Yeah. Yeah. And now I realize that you don't have to have money. Sometimes just ignore. Just saying, Not Hey, sometimes, every time. <laughs> yeah. And just acknowledging someone's presence that they exist in the world and saying hello and asking them genuinely how they're doing can that is such, that is more than money, you know, because you're talking about a community who's very marginalized, walked by every day, judged, looked down on, ignored, you know, um, and that costs literally nothing, to yeah. do, you know, and so now I drive around in my car, I have all these supplies, hygiene kits, that's something everyone can do, you can make a hygiene kit. And everyone's like, what goes in a hygiene kit? Well, if you need it, the streets need it. You know, like it's toothbrush, deodorant, condoms, water, wet wipes, um, whatever, you know, whatever it is. Uh, I carry uh, women. Women need feminine hygiene supplies, you know. And that was a big thing that Sidewalk started doing right from the jump was because it came out of the punk rock community. A lot of bands like the Bomb Pops and all the different bands that were involved, they would do 
a thing where if you bought brought a box of tampons to the show, you got five dollars off your ticket. And then we would bring all we bring all those supplies to the streets. And that's the other thing I love about it. It's not some charity organization that you're donating to and you don't know where that money goes or a lot of organizations a lot of money that you're donating is going to administrative fees and operating costs and not necessarily to where it needs to go and that's the one thing I love about sidewalk project is that we take all the stuff there our team like there's no middleman it's mm -hmm. not just you know you know where the money's going and and um that's huge so during, that's important because yeah, these days you never huge. know right <laughs> huge. and yeah. so during um during COVID, I was driving, I have chickens and my last chickens had died. So I had picked up some new chickens and I was driving back. I also had also picked up a couple like mattress pad things for when we have guests for the guest room and they came with extra. And I was like, oh, I'm going to bring these to sidewalk project, you know, for someone's bed if they need it. I was driving home and this guy was flying a sign that said, I, you know, need help. And I was like, Hey man, do you need a bed? And he was like, yeah. I was like, cool. Meet me at the gas station. I got one for you. And <laughs> he's like, okay. And he's like, who are you? You're like an angel. Like, why'd you stop? And I started telling him about Sidewalk Project. And I was like, it started in the punk rock community. My friends started it. It taught me to see people. And I just can't ignore people anymore. I, it's like impossible. And uh, I also learned not everyone wants to be talked to. <laughs> like, sure. that's part of it. At first, you're like, oh, I want to talk to everyone. And then you have to remember that, like, you're literally in someone's home while they're on the street. So you have to be very mindful and respectful of their space. And it took Sidewalk Project didn't just go into Skid Row and just start doing shit. Like, it took time to develop relationships with community members there and develop relationships so that, you know, no one's coming in being a savior. We really want to figure out what does the community need? Well, you got to ask the community. You can't just assume what the community needs. You can't just assume, you know, what people need. You, you have to listen. And so, um, so anyway, the guy's like, why'd you stop? I start telling him about sidewalk project. He's like, I was in a punk rock band and I know a girl named Emily from work tour. And I was like, no way. And I was like, okay, cool. And he, I was like, so what's up? What do you need? And he's like, well, I'm just trying to get enough money for a phone. I'm getting job opportunities. And, um, I don't have any way for anyone to get a hold of me. And I had just got my first stimulus check and I really didn't have any money either. And I've never just pulled money out of the ATM and gave it to someone before, but I just felt like that was the right thing to do in the moment. <laughs> and I pulled a hundred bucks out and gave wow. him the money. And he, and I was like, I got to go. There's chicken shitting in my car. <laughs> I have to go. Um, <laughs> get, but I'm going to come back. I'm going to go get, get, grab some supplies from my house. I'll come back and find you. Where are you going to take this mattress? He's like, I'm going to take it to the church over here. There's a place to sleep. I said, okay. So I went home grabbed some supplies for him, came back, um, drove around, couldn't find him anywhere. And I was so kind of bummed. I was like, damn, yeah, you know, whatever, whatever he needed the money for is whatever he needed the money for. I'm not judging it. So I stop at the store and grab some stuff I needed on the way home. And I get a text from him and he's like, yo, Beats, I just got my phone. I'm like, yeah. I was like, where are you? And he's like, I'm right outside uh, the Rite Aid, which was where I had stopped on the way home. I was like, I'm right here. And so we just sat in the parking lot until like three hours and I showed him a really dope spot to sleep up on the cliffs by the beach, by my house. I was like, cause I always am like, if I was ever homeless, that's where I would sleep. I think about things like this. Wow. So, I'm like, yes. so I'm like, yo, I know this dope spot. So I bring him over there and uh, he's like, I'm a drummer and I play some guitar. So I brought my guitar over and we jammed a little bit. And then, um, and I'm how, how old him. was this kid, this guy? He's like, in his 30s late 30s probably okay okay so he was i find out that he's coming he 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 had some addiction problems and then he lost his mom and he went off the deep end and like mm -hmm. imploded his business went to mexico and just doing drugs like he was still a little coming out of this fog of like a lot of drugs too you know but he was going through all these range of emotions and thoughts and i would just be there to be a sounding board you know mm -hmm. he's like beebs how should i handle my addictions and i was like dude I don't know. I'm addicted to sugar. <laughs> I said, I got my own addictions that I need to curb, but I can, I don't have all the answers for you, but I can be a support system for you, you know, but that pushed me to try to get off myself off sugar. Cause that's like the realest addiction. Wow. Had. Yeah. I bet that's hard. That's <laughs> you know, really so hard. hard. Um, but anyways, <clears throat> that's so, an, that's um, an amazing story. So I, mean. I see Emily from punk rock paintbrushes. Mm -hmm. Uh, she comes over. I haven't seen her in a while. I said, I've met this guy. I've been working with him. Um, he says he knows you. And she goes, 
I don't know any guy named Josh. And I'm, I had a picture of him because I had given him some clothes and he had gotten into a hotel room and he was feeling all dapper and sent me a photo like, he's feeling so good in these new clothes. Like, yeah. <laughs> and I showed her the picture and she zoomed in because he has a full beard, you know. She zoomed in and she starts bawling her eyes out. And I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? Like, what did he do? Like, who? I, I'm ready to fight. Like, who is this guy? Like, I'm kind of getting sketched now. And she goes, that's our friend. We've been looking for him for a year. And she's one of the founders of Sidewalk Project. Whoa. Yeah. And so they started going to sober meetings together. I connect them. Now he has a job and living in a house, got a car. Um, yeah, it's cool. You know, it's a cool, it, that's, that's where I found my space. That's like, powerful. Other than producing and doing stuff, like I'm always going to make music. I'm always going to work on projects, but right now that's like, my passion is having enough time to basically be a street social worker and just keep up with people. And, you know, I, there is such a thing as compassion fatigue. You can get overwhelmed. That's the system's full of, cause there's not enough sure. resources to um, accommodate the crisis of houselessness here in California. And I'm sure nationwide, but um, how but can uh, people find sidewalk project online? You can go to the sidewalk project.org okay. and we have instructions <laughs> on how you can start your own in your own town. Um, and we do zoom meetings every week or every two weeks. Cool. Um, and touch base with all the different chapters all, all over the country. There's one in Australia and France as well. One in Australia is called the Footpath Project. And um, and yeah, so there we, we're all learning. Um, we're all growing together. And this is like a an issue that we're not going to solve overnight. But we're, we're all getting there. And we partner with a lot of people like Food Not Bombs. Shout out to Food Not Bombs Las Vegas. They've been crushing it, building tiny homes. Mm. Um, for, for the houses community there. Love and, tiny um, homes. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, so, thank thank you. That's yeah. that's amazing. Thank you for sharing about all this because uh, it's news to me. But uh, it, it seems like it's something that could just spread. You could you could get people doing the sidewalk project in every town in America if it's needed. You know, dude, it's easy. <clears> and what what if everyone just you know? And it doesn't even have to be. People like look in your own communities, look in your own family, look in your own friend circle. I mean, a lot of pride is a hell of a thing. You know, I really had to learn humility last year when my whole industry got shut down. All my incomes got shut down. The only honestly, the only way I survived last year was, you know, my Bootsy project, a couple other projects I had. But also I had a couple of fans reach out and be like, do you need money? And I had to say, yeah, I'm yeah, I had to accept the help. And it's hard. It's very easy to want to be helpful because that feels good. And mm -hmm. it's very hard to want to accept help because it doesn't feel as good as helping yeah. someone else. Yeah. And so I think, um, you know, looking at even aside from maybe there isn't a large houseless population in your community, but I'm sure there's families and people struggling in your own community that aren't saying anything that may need help, like help make them some food, help buy them mm -hmm. some groceries. Good point. And don't, yeah. don't be like a, all on some savior shit about it. Just be a good friend. Like, what would you do for your best friend? You know what I mean? You'd be there for them. And it's not about showing everyone on social media how helpful you are or that you're saving someone. We're just simply showing up for each other. And I think that's something that is definitely missed in the American culture. In other cultures, families, people look out for each other. It's totally normal for a whole family and generations of families to live in one house in other cultures. Here, mm -hmm that's frowned upon for some reason. Like it's okay to be a community. It's okay to help each other. Um, it alleviates stress and, and it makes more time for people to have with their kids, with their loved ones, with their families. Like don't think that you have to be in the world alone. I was raised to be an independent woman. Like fuck that. I, I need, I need all my friends. Like we are in this together. I am independent to, to an extent, but I, I try not to take that pride too far because we do need each other. We all need each other, you know? Well and, said. Uh, yeah. I think that's important. Love it. I love what you're doing. I love this project. I mean, everything. Thank you so much for sharing and and just showing yeah. people what it's like to be a well-rounded person. It's great. Well, um, you know, I have my I have my battles, too. Of but, course. You know, of course. Of course. I've really found some solstice and microdosing. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you, Michelle Biebs. How can people find you online? Where do you want people to go? Um, you can go to biebsmusic.com. That has uh, all, where all my music lives, where all the new stuff's coming out. Uh, all the new music's coming out under Biebs. Uh, new singles out on Spotify under that. And then you can find me on social media, on Twitter and Instagram, at Biebs Money. And... 
I just have to say thank you, Mike Carrera, because 15 year old me is always stoked to talk to you. Because <laughs> I'm like, I love MXPX, but also you're just a really great person. You're a beautiful, you know, you're a beautiful soul. And I love how much you love your family, how tight your family is, how innovative you are, and how much you stay on top of your hustle too, um, of creativity and how much you embrace other artists and give, you know, help uplift other people too. And I really appreciate that about you. you know? ah, so well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. That's, that means a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. All right. We'll do it again. We'll do it again sometime. We'll Until do it again then, soon. Go out and slay. Slay. Oh, dude, I didn't tell you I started playing bass. Did you really? Oh my yeah. God. All right. Norman's so been giving me bass lessons. That's what we'll talk about. Next excellent. Time. I, yes, we will talk about that next time. We'll, we'll find out how you learn, what you're playing, what you're doing. I'll, we'll, we'll talk all about technique too, which I'm not a super technique guy, but I know a little bit about bass. So I, a, little, <laughs> a little, a little bit. bit about some really rad bass lines. Awesome. All right. Well, have a great day. Have a great week. I'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thanks. Bye. Peace. Bye.